Hello everyone, and welcome back to Red Raptor Right, everyone's favorite hodgepodge of Spider-Man, Dinosaurs, Bioshock, and now apparently Avatar content. A few months ago I uploaded Prince Zuko, the perfect character arc, and a lot of you guys seemed to like it. So here's the totally necessary and planned sequel about the even cooler sibling, Princess Azula, the perfect villain. When I first watched Avatar The Last Airbender, I really enjoyed book one, and of course Zuko was amazing, but the show becomes truly legendary at the start of book two, when Azula is officially introduced. She's everything a good villain should be, and definitely deserves more recognition as a perfect villain. Just like how we looked at Zuko as the model for writing character arcs, let's analyze what The Last Airbender accomplished with his sister to see how to write compelling villains because, oh boy, I've seen plenty of misfires on screen who can never compare to a teenage princess. So guys, let's dig this up. Despite being only 14, Azula is one of the most intimidating villains put on screen. Yeah, Ozai serves the final boss role for the series, but it's her who is the main, immediate threat to Aang and his friends, and boy is she threatening. It is integral to any conflict that the antagonist be an actual threat. This sounds obvious, but apparently some multi-billion dollar franchises can't figure this one out. Captain. There's a guy we can scare. I had four biscuits and I ate one. Then I only had three. If you want tension, fear, and a nail-biting experience, the villain needs to be intimidating. This is why so many bad guys have the same power set as the good guy, so there's an easy comparison between their power levels. Yes, it's a cliche at this point, but it gets the job done. Think Spider-Man and Venom, Wolverine and Sabretooth, Iron Man and Ironmonger, Zuko and Azula. Okay, let me get this out of the way. The dialogue for this killer is amazing. Her lines would be hilarious, if not pure fear-inducing. She has a sense of humor, but it's so twisted and violent, it's amazing. Thankfully, Azula's not all talk, which again sounds obvious, but some people can't figure this out. This firebender has the power to back up her words, pretty much being the only one capable of single-handedly taking on Aang and surviving a battle against, well, everybody. In fact, the first time watching her firebend blew me away pun intended. Just the fact that her fire is blue lets the audience know that she is far more powerful than any other firebender. Fires appear as different colors depending on the temperature and fuel being burned. Although not always the case because fuel affects color as well, hotter flames create shorter wavelengths on the light spectrum, so blue and violet will appear at hotter temperatures with red and orange at cooler temps. A typical yellow flame that 99% of benders emit comes at a temperature between 1200 and 1400 degrees Celsius. Sources seem to vary, but blue flames occur above 1500 degrees when a natural gas is being burned. Sorry for the short science lesson, but intentional or not, the last airbender uses chemistry CHEMISTRY to establish Azula as the ultimate firebender. It's an instant visual to display her strength, certainly some of the best visual storytelling I've ever seen. I know I'm geeking out a little, but that's awesome. And her blue fire also serves as an easy way to determine who's who in a firefight, preventing it from being a hard to follow mess on screen like Oh, I don't know, Venom, where we have to watch a black blob fight a gray blob at night. Plus, the blue and yellowish orange form complementary colors, so it's visually appealing. Okay, wait, 
is this a video essay on the fire or Azula herself? Okay, back to the murderous princess. And the visual storytelling doesn't end there. In fact, the entire show is full of it. But importantly for Azula, before she even appears in her first episode, before she even says a line of dialogue, in episode 7, The Storm, she makes a small cameo, and in that tiny 5 second cameo, we can already tell her entire character. It takes place in Uncle Iwa's flashback, when he's describing Zuko's backstory, getting burned in an Agni Kai with Ozai. In the flashback, Uncle Iroh looks away in pain, but Azula is watching very maniacally, enjoying it. Enjoying watching her brother get flamed to the face. Just these five seconds alone show the ruthlessness and viciousness of this crazed character. The only thing matching her ferocity is her intellect. You've beaten me at my own game. Don't flatter yourself. You were never even a player. It's so cool how conniving she is. Even as a small child, Azula constantly strategizes and tries to use every situation to her advantage. When her cousin Lu Ten died on the front lines leaving Iro distressed, she instantly pivoted to supporting Ozai's inheritance of the throne since she would have more upward mobility under his reign. Also, her lying to Ozai that Zuko killed Aang at Ba Sing Se, just in case he survived, letting it be Zuko's problem instead. She's always 10 steps ahead of our heroes, making her far more threatening and just so dang entertaining to watch on screen. Years back when I was Tim Rex, I made a video about overpowered villains and why writers should avoid them. If you want to see the full thing, here's the card and link in the description. But this next part will tackle some of the same ideas. Being OP makes characters feel less lifelike and more like boring plot devices. Yes, they might serve their plot function, but attachment to the character will be minimal. Nobody is that powerful. Nobody can overcome their obstacles that easily, so being super ultra powerful creates a disconnect from the audience. And when a villain is invincible, the tension is reduced. There needs to be some glimpse of hope for the hero to win for the battle to be engaging. We've got to be on the edge of our seat hoping the hero can pull through, but if they have no chance, then that tension is lost. Thankfully, Azula isn't like this. She's far more than just an all-powerful enemy for Zuko to overcome. She's an actual character with actual flaws that hold her back. There are two main weaknesses that cause her downfall. The first being her ideology. I'll talk more in depth about that in a bit, but Azula believes she can maintain control of her friends through fear. At the Boiling Rock prison, Azula is so overconfident in her control over her two friends, Mei and Tylee, that she assumes they'll let her kill Zuko. Even for a teenager capable of cooing the Earth Kingdom, Azula ends up way over her head. As for her second flaw, well, she's insane. Drawn to madness by the belief that her mother never loved her. Is it that sad? <laughs> Yes, I suppose that is rather sad, but Squidward can hug himself during his break. She tries to shake it off and create the facade that she's invincible, but that image quickly falls apart at her betrayal. Once backstabbed by her closest allies, the sad cocktail of hate and paranoia turns her into a foaming psycho. It becomes clear to the audience and Zuko that she has easily exploitable weaknesses for the main characters to take advantage of. This is a must in any conflict if you want me to care. So you see, Azula's not just an unstoppable plot device, but a broken human being like everyone else, even if she doesn't want to show it. My own mother thought I was a monster. She was right, of course, but it still hurt. There's a lot to learn from the wannabe Fire Lord, but this is the last portion I'll be highlighting. When it comes to writing villains, well, you've got to remember that they are not the main character, the protagonist. They're the antagonist, a supporting character. Yes, they may be a great character, but if they're not serving their role of challenging the protagonist, then they're a bigger failure than Shyamalan. <laughs> a 
A villain has to counter their hero. If not, then the conflict is uninteresting. Just a good guy fighting a bad guy. For example, Joker needs Batman, Doc Ock needs Spider-Man, and Azula needs Zuko. A conflict between Zuko and Azula is endlessly fascinating, but I don't think she would be all that great if her opponent was Tony Stark. No thanks, we've gotten enough of those. Princess Azula and Prince Zuko are perfect foils for one another since they're diametrically opposed in just about every way. You're like my sister. Everything always came easy to her. She's a firebending prodigy, and everyone adores her. My father says she was born lucky. He says I was lucky to be born. I don't need luck though. I don't want it. Azula is cold and calculating, where Zuko is impulsive and reactionary. Azula is a ruthless, vicious warrior, while Zuko is compassionate. Azula uses fear to keep her friends and nation in line, but Zuko uses peace and kindness. She's loved by their father, who is just as menacing, while Zuko was loved by their mother for his heart. She's always calm in the face of danger, keeping her emotional problems tucked inside, even making light of them, while Zuko, literally and metaphorically, wears them on his face. The philosophical conflict between Ozai and Ivo passes down to the next generation, and the battle between kindness and fear continues. Because Azula and Zuko are perfect foils for each other, their battles are far deeper than just who can firebend harder. They're about the ideology that will shape the future of the world. They present the classic question whether it's better to be feared or loved. We see this culminate in their final battle. Azula is alone and on the brink of insanity. She's imprisoned her two friends who have always been fighting with her, while Zuko managed to get on the good side of the gang member who hated him the most, Katara, and it's her who puts down Azula. The prince's embrace of Iroh's ideology is what saves him, the Fire Nation, and the world. So you see, it's not just who Azula is herself that makes her an amazing antagonist, but her opposition to Zuko. Avatar The Last Airbender is an amazing show, and much of its success is due to the fantastic psycho Princess Azula. Not only does her inclusion push the series to legendary status, but serves as a prime example of how to write bad guys, just like how Zuko is a perfect example of your typical character arc. To become truly great, an antagonist needs to be a real challenge for our protagonist to overcome. They can't be too overpowered, with the consequence being just an uninteresting plot device instead of having an engaging conflict, and they've got to be a good fit for the protagonist. You can't just mix and match heroes and villains and expect gold. Oh, also show, don't tell storytelling helps too. All these aspects combined create the most intimidating and enjoyable villain I've ever seen, at least on TV anyways. So friends at home and Hollywood writers, remember to take notes from The Last Airbender's Azula before you create the next Kylo Ren or Ronin. Remember, if you enjoyed this video, to please leave a like, subscribe, and check out my social media. See you next time.